You know, one of the, my favorite things about leading a life group is sometimes I get a new believer in my group, and it brings life to the text. I mean, you're telling these stories that honestly I've heard many times, and they're like, <laughs> you guys are just sitting there and be raised Lazarus from the dead, like stuff like that, where it's just blowing their mind. And it reminds me how often we lose the wonder of what is there. And so I'm going to help the process of renewing the wonder this morning in Mark 4, all right? Okay, so I just want to set the stage real quick before we get into it. You are, this is over 2,000 years old. You're an agrarian society. You're an Israelite, all right? All that. You hear of this man named Jesus, and you think this might be the Messiah. I mean, this, this guy is walking around. Someone reaches out their old withered hand, and he brings it back to life. So he's healing blind person. This guy is so powerful, you just have to touch him, and you're healed. I mean, that creates a follower, whether we have social media or not, people are following him, and they're going along, and if you can touch someone by healing, you better believe this is like Black Friday on steroids. They are like breaking down to get in, and they're pressing all against him. I mean, they're pressing in so much, the sons of thunder can't even hold them back, and so he has to get on a boat to get away from this crowd to speak to them. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, I get like uncomfortable at Disneyland when people are pressing in on me. No one's trying to get healed. And he's out on the water. And the water, one of the great things about water is it makes the noise louder. And they're sitting on the hillside and he's about to tell a parable. See, there's no John Deere tractors. They, this is how you sowed a field back then. You'd have the bag of seed, and you would just walk through and throw it. And you'd throw the seed. And so he begins to tell this parable, and he says, some of the seed, it falls on the path, and the birds of the air swoop down and pick it up. Some seed falls on rocky soil, and it sprouts and comes to life, but then when the sun comes out, it withers and dies. Still other seed falls amongst the thorns. And it sprouts, but the thorns choke it out, and it becomes unfruitful. But thank goodness there's a fourth seed, and that falls on the fertile land. And it grows and produces a harvest 30, 60, some 100 times. Now, since there are some farmers in the room, but not everyone is farmers, I want to tell you the harvest rate is 5 to 15 is really good. 5 to 15 times. 30 to a 60 to 100 times. I got to imagine they're like on the hillside, all the farmers breaking out their scrolls and like writing down. Not only is this guy a carpenter, not only does he heal people, but he, we're going to be prosperity with farming. I mean, he's showing us the secrets here. And I know that they were thinking something like that because the disciples come up to Jesus just clueless. Like, what was that about? And it's easy to rip them apart because we've read the end of the story. <laughs> but they don't have a clue. And so Jesus goes, hey, guys, come on. If you don't get this parable, how are you going to get the rest of them? Okay, now you no longer have amnesia. We're stepping back. When the Son of God, when God himself says, if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to get the rest of them? I, my ears perk up. Start to pay attention. So I want to explain a few things about the parable. So let's read Mark 4, 14, when he's explaining to the disciples the parable. He says, the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. First thing I want to point out is he is sowing. He is sowing God's word. It'll be on the back of your outline there. He's sowing God's word. Jesus has not died and resurrected yet. He, the, he is sowing the word of God, the word of God. And what is he sowing? What are the soil? It's us, right? And our hearts, our hearts. See, that's the first point I would like to point out is check your heart. Check your heart. 
And we'll do a diagnostic today of checking our hearts. See, at Family Church, we have this, it's head, heart, hands. And we, in all the ministries, we kind of go through this. In life groups, questions will start out head, then they will go heart, then they will go hands for this purpose. We need to know the text. He's sowing the word of God. If we do not understand what is going on there intellectually, we're tying it to all sorts of different things. And it is not a good thing. I mean, Zach can put some really cool things in scripture that's not there. Uh, so I need to know what it says. But honestly, guys, if it ends there, it is meaningless. I mean, Satan knows about Jesus and he quakes. Like, the intellectual part is we need it, but if it stops there, it's nothing. And all too often, I can fall in the trap of entertainment, of thinking I'm growing by growing my brain. True growth happens when it hits my heart. When it hits my heart. When I know who I am in Christ, that is awesome, what the text says. When I know who I am in Christ, it changes everything. It is when we know in our hearts we have no choice but to do something different. And I act different, and the hands is the output. It is frustrating and death if I start at hands. If I just try to do it, right? Have you tried to do the word of God on your own? Just bootstrap it. It does not last long. <laughs> For me, it does not last long. So head, heart, hands. So let's examine the different soil types and the different hearts that are in this room, all right? So the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. The first heart type is a hard heart. Hard heart. Hard soil, hard heart. But do you know who the last person to know they have a hard heart is? The person with the hard heart. Like when my, if I'm hard hearted, I don't know it. Everyone else around me does. So we're going to do a little Jeff Foxworthy this morning. You might be hard hearted. <laughs> if a sermon isn't ever for you, We usually know who it is for, but not ourselves. You might be hard-hearted if you are always right and never wrong. If you are the only one that knows how to drive, you might be hard-hearted if you stop genuinely caring. You might be hard-hearted if you no longer believe the best about people. See, one of the things about a hard heart and a hard path, nothing can stick. I mean, it's like Teflon bouncing off there. Pastor Paul talked about last week that John the Baptist came to till that soil of the hard hearts that were there. And I know for sure on that hillside that day were hard hearts. And I know for sure that there are hard hearts in the room. That's one thing that's consistent. It's a hard heart. There's a second type of heart and soil type that I want to discuss here. Oh, there's the picture, and I forgot to say anything. <laughs> Others like seeds sown on rocky places. Hear the word. And once receive it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When the trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. There is no root, no root at all. And it's the second type, which is a shallow heart, a shallow heart. And as I was thinking about the shallow heart, I was reminded back to um, Saturdays in the Newman household growing up. This is not the lawn, but it looked a lot like this. Uh, my, my dad can garden like no one else. I mean, his thumb is like green, green. Um, he doesn't have a black thumb of death like some people. Uh, he, he can grow stuff. And our lawn, I mean, there was not a weed in it. it, it was, and it was mowed. I learned the hard way. There was specific, the lines have to go this way. Like, don't you mess it up. You circled it. What were you doing? <laughs> lines straight. I mean, I didn't know whether to get out a putter 
or strap on the football uniform to get out there. I mean, a perfect yard. Every Saturday, we would go and manicure the whole acre and a half. And it was hard. I mean, 22-hour days, no lunch breaks. I'm pretty sure if the government showed up, Dad would have gotten in trouble. Now, he says we were done at 11, but I don't believe him. Uh, The perspective was very different for me. Now, here's the thing about that beautiful lawn. Every August, there was this spot, weird-shaped spot, and it would go dead. It would go yellow, and Dad would just get ticked off. Oh, I'm not watering enough. And I mean, the whole rest of the yard's soggy, still a yellow spot. And so his nitrogen, I mean, he's doing every fertilizer on this. Uh, I mean, he was one step away from sending soil samples off. <laughs> um, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, he was close to going crazy. I have never seen a man obsess about a, something that much as my father, but he, he was gonna solve the problem until he couldn't anymore after years of trying. He got so fed up, I'm just getting rid of this thing. Puts the shovel in the ground, clink! The exact same spot as that yellow spot was a rock that he had to tear out. See, what he was doing there is what we need to do with our hearts. Are we willing to examine? Are we willing to examine? See, part of the price of living in a fallen world is I am a son of Adam, and all you women in here are daughters of Eve, and therefore, we hurt each other. We just do. I mean, be in a church two seconds, you're gonna get hurt. Be out in the world for two seconds, you're gonna get hurt. I mean, there's one thing that guarantees, it doesn't matter where we go, we are going to get hurt. We also have on top of that our sins, our addictive behavior, and all the other things, and it forms this shallow heart on rocky soil. See, we build grievances in our soul and build alliances with self-deceptive thoughts. And I will give you a practical example from a long, long time ago from my life on Tuesday. Working at a church is wonderful. It is also hard. Tuesdays are full of meetings, which I love. (laughs) So we have meetings all day Tuesday. I had a lot of counseling meetings. Um, It was just a difficult day. I'm giving you all my excuses ahead of time. And I walk in the door at the end of a long day knowing for sure dinner will be waiting my kids will listen to every word out of my mouth. Oh, I'm just going to put my feet up. Maybe one of them will grab a fan to fan me. <laughs> I'm not sure. Surprisingly, it wasn't like that, and it was a lot noisier. <laughs> to which I patiently, not so much, yelled. See, that was just a little persecution, and my little roots were showing. See, we have all sorts of excuses for why we don't do things. And it's usually involving everyone else except me. I yelled because the kids were loud. It's their fault. They should just listen to every word out of my mouth. My wife shouldn't tell me when I'm wrong. That's why I lost my temper. I mean, all I did was load the dishwasher. I mean, it was perfect. I, I tell you, marriage... Finances, dishes is number two (laughs) on that list. When we face persecution, our rocks begin to show, but often we don't ask the question behind the question. We start blaming. Are you willing to examine, instead of saying it's this person's fault, it's this outside force fault, it's God, show me what is in my life that's causing this, because I make lots of great excuses for me. That's not me. That was just a moment in time. No, that showed my shallow roots. Ask the question behind the question. Are you willing to examine? And church, if we're gonna be people helping people find and follow Jesus, that means we're gonna be discipling. Bless you. (laughs) You... 
you are gonna run into people that you're discipling with a shallow heart. And here's what I have to say is be patient with others, be patient. Rocks do not remove themselves quickly. Rocks do not remove themselves quickly. My dad's yard, when my parents pulled that rock up, which was quite the fiasco, it looked like, why did you do that? There's now a crater there. And then after the dirt's there, it's still, and I think sometimes we get impatient with the Holy Spirit's work in someone's life, and it looks like they're going opposite direction, but really what's happening is they're coming to a healing understanding. In fact, I grew up in the church, I knew how to play church very well, and when God was removing a rock in my life, I started to go a little less often, because I wasn't going because I was supposed to go anymore. I started reading the word a little less often for a season, Both things came back. If someone would have stopped and said, no, you have to be there, you have to do this, it would have stopped what God was doing in my life. Be patient with the people you are discipling. It is not easy and it is not pretty. Discipling and removing rocks is an ugly business, but thank God it's a God business and he's in it. Be patient with others. See, we're passionate about removing these rocks at Family Church, so passionate that we started, there's a ministry called Renewal Ministry. And it's got, from Conqueror Series, if you're struggling with sexual addiction, divorce care, there's restoration, there are so many different avenues and so many different rocks that, if we're honest, are in our lives. But I wanna highlight that one that's in your program, and it's called Surrendering the Secret. If you've had an abortion, or have been a part of that in any way, shape, or form, honestly, That's a rock in your life. And I know with rocks, there's a sense of shame. And sometimes we don't talk about rocks because of the shame that I feel for my rocks, and I think every single other person does. But there is no shame and condemnation in a rock. God wants to do a work. And this class is gonna start um, at the Hope Center, March 5th, 6.30 to 8. We take a very cautious approach to honestly all those different ministries that are dealing with rocks, but this one especially is that people will not know you're in this class. The only person that gets who's going and not going is the one that is running the class. Protecting each other and having a safe place is of the utmost importance to all of us. Don't avoid the rocks just because it's messy. Because it stunts the work God's gonna do. He goes on to describe another soil type and heart type. Still others like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. There's three things that choke the word. Worries. Who's got worries? I got them. (laughs) Deceitfulness of wealth, fall into that trap. Desires for other things. I mean, I feel like a thorny mess just reading this. See, this is a crowded heart. And I think it's the most common in our blessed country we live in. We are so prosperous that crowded comes easy. It comes so easy. but it's a dangerous thing. I heard this last week, Chris Arnold, one of the elders here, shared at an elder meeting about uh, one of my favorite plants and trees, the fir tree. I mean, not only are these things beautiful to look at, it also provides for our economy in our area. And I, honestly, I could sit in the, one of our windows and look at the fir trees all day. I mean, it, it, what a beautiful area we live in. I mean, they are so tall and <laughs> I mean, I don't think anything can touch this. It, it shocked, the elders, it shocked me, one of the most dangerous things for fir trees. So we're gonna play Where's Waldo with the fir tree. Where is the fir tree? One of the most dangerous things for a fir tree is blackberry plants. When they are planted, you have to guard against them. If that happens, fir tree is right here, by the way. Uh, 
If that happens, it will never grow straight to full maturity. It'll be a scrawny looking thing that will be of no use. Often we have thorns around us. See, we need to direct our heart, direct your heart, direct your heart. And I believe that happens with four different things. Direct your heart. You can write them on the side if you want, but some things we need to reduce. We need to reduce. For me, it is my cell phone. It distracts from God and it distracts from my family. But man, you just get trapped scrolling. Reduce. What do you need to reduce? Eliminate. The Apostle Paul said, right, some things are good for me, not everything's good for me, but all things are good for me. Right? I am not talking about sin. Sin, we know, needs to eliminate. I am talking about non-sin behavior that is keeping us from God. We just need to eliminate it. We're, stop playing with it. It is distraction. The third thing that's difficult, but man, you gotta guard this or we're in trouble, is we need margin. We need margin. If your day is so packed, I don't have time to read the Bible or I don't have time to stop and listen to the Holy Spirit and what he's telling me to do, that is a serious problem. But it happens too often in my life. Give margin. But those are nothing if we don't fall in love more with Jesus. And that's the fourth thing. Fall in love more with Jesus. That is how we direct our heart. See, I don't think that we go directly away from God with a crowded heart. And it reminded me of one of my finer moments. Um, Three days into our honeymoon in Kauai, uh, my wife and I got to this beach and we were the first ones there. I mean, I love to snorkel. And so I got all excited. I mean, I got snorkel. And Rachel says, you need to put on some suntan lotion before you go in. And I'm like, it'll go off in the water. Like, I'm just going to be for 15 minutes. I'll come back and put it on. Um, So I jump in the ocean and snorkeling around, sea turtles, beautiful fish. I mean, and it's never, everywhere I was was no further than 10 feet down. I mean, it was just, I was in heaven. It seemed like a minute until I, put my head above the water, and the shore was really small, way far away. Oh, it took everything I had to swim back. I looked like a drowned rat coming out of the water. Uh, uh, and Rachel didn't need to say a thing. She just needed to smile. And it said everything. So that's the first lesson, bonus lesson for you men, listen to your wife. But uh, the next day, I mean, guys, I think I was out there two or three hours. Uh, I was walking like this. I mean, we're in tropical paradise, and we're having to watch a movie because I didn't listen. Um, White boy in the Hawaiian sun does not end well. See, I think that's what happens in our lives. We do not set out to wander away and crowd our heart with all these other things. We just wander. I'm gonna add this, I'm gonna add this, oh, a little bit of that. And then all of a sudden we say really dumb things, I don't know if I'm allowed to say dumb, but dumb things and say, I don't have time to read the Bible. I mean, think about that for a second. Like, Jesus gave his life for me, and I go, I really don't have time. You know, it's a really packed day, God. I mean, and I really needed sleep and snooze felt good. And I mean, that's just me, like three times. Uh, Maybe I'll feel like getting out of bed, I think is what I do. But we do this thing where we start putting everything in front of God. And we've got such a crowded heart. Such a crowded heart. And if we're going to be people helping people find and follow Jesus, we will be, guarantee we will be, discipling others with a crowded heart. And I would say be persistent with others. Be persistent. Be persistent. Now, sometimes I can get insecure and think that everything's about me. And so sometimes I will be discipling someone with a crowded heart and they cancel often. 
because they're busy. I mean, that's the thing that happens with a crowded heart. And then I start thinking, why don't they like me? What did I do? What did I do wrong? Let me say this to you. <laughs> I say to myself, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's what's going on in them. And they have a crowded heart, and we're just going to have to be persistent. And you're going to have to keep reaching out to them. You're going to have to get on that version when you invited them to your Bible study and they said they didn't have time, and invite them again, and again, and again, and again, and love them again, and again, and pray for them again, and again. Be persistent. We give up too easy on someone with a crowded heart, and we say, well, they're just, they just don't want to change. Be persistent with others. One of the greatest mentors here at Family Church for me is pretty much all of them. All the pastors, every one of you guys have been awesome. And sometimes I get so busy and crowded that I'm like, ah, I know we had a schedule plan, but I don't have time today. I'm going to come. I am thankful. Thank goodness. Thank you, Lord, that they did not say, well, then you're just immature. I'm not going to meet with you anymore. Instead, it was, Meet with me again and point out, point out my crowded heart. I really believe if we're persistent with others, we will see the change coming. There's a fourth type of soil that's talked about here, and it says others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop some 30 some 60, some 100 times what was soil sown. Good soil. It's a soft heart. Soft heart. And I am not talking about a soft heart like we cry at a Hallmark movie. Soft heart. I'm talking soft heart to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life. Soft heart, when I read the word of God, I say, yes, God, oh, that's broken in me. Change me, God. Conviction is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And all too often, I have confused it in my life with condemnation, which in my life sometimes comes like that right after conviction. Condemnation is not from God. Conviction is. See, soft hearts are not our natural state. And so we need to guard our heart. Guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. As I guard my heart, it remains soft to God's work in my life. As I guard my heart. See, guarding our heart is not a passive thing. It is proactive. It's choosing to keep a soft heart. See, sometimes... Trust is broken. And I'm talking people to people here, but sometimes when we have relationships, we cut off from God as well. But trust gets broken, and we harden our heart to it. I believe good marriages aren't built on trust. They're built on soft hearts. Because I'm a son of Adam. My wife shouldn't trust me. But keeping her heart soft and keeping my heart soft, that is us going from glory to glory. It's the same thing with God our Father. It's a soft heart. It's a soft heart. See, I was reminded when I was thinking about a soft heart, I was thinking about agriculture, surprise, it's reminding me of the Chinese bamboo tree. And the Chinese bamboo tree, and we have bamboo around here, but I'm specifically talking about the Chinese bamboo tree. The Chinese bamboo tree sits dormant in the ground for five years. In fact, you sow it into the ground, you will see nothing for five years. If you stop tending, tending it, it will die. Five years in the ground, no sign of life. In six weeks, this thing grows 90 feet after five years. 90 feet. It took five years and six weeks to grow 90 feet. 
but we only saw evidence in that six-week time. And I think one of the things we need to guard our hearts again is these. When I see that things do not match what the Bible says, I'm in a world of danger because I stop trusting God, the creator of the universe, to bring out a harvest that's 30, 60, 100 times, and I start going, it's just not working out. And I start to harden up for those around me and harden up to God's touch. Guard your heart against your eyes. Guard your heart by memorizing scripture and speaking it when you feel like nothing is matching it. Guard your heart. See, if we're gonna be people helping people find and follow Jesus, we will also be discipling those that have a soft heart. And we need to be perceptive of other, with others. We need to be perceptive. Here's the thing. If every single person at Family Church, every single one of us, if we discipled one, one person, Man, that would change so much. But it shouldn't end there. See, people helping people find and follow Jesus is a multiplying effect. When we are perceptive that someone is soft to the Holy Spirit and we're discipling them, we need to teach them to lead someone else. And when one leads one, leads one, leads one, we have a Douglas County that is dark come to light. Be perceptive. Teach them to do what you do. Show them how to find their own answers in scriptures. Be perceptive. There is a weird thing that helps plants grow. And it is manure. See, manure... We'll buy it at Bymart and Lowe's. Steer manure to put it on our plants. Sometimes all life is giving us is manure. It feels like everything's going wrong. Everything possibly couldn't be any worse. You know what happens in good soil when you do that? put that on there? 30, 60 to 100 times fold return. It shoots everything up. It brings it to life. God can use the worst things, our worst day, to bring about a harvest if we keep our hearts soft. And I don't know if it's going to happen on this side of eternity or the other, but I do know that I trust him to do it. I trust him. I trust him even when I don't trust him. And sometimes I have to talk myself into trusting him. Because it's too easy for me to look at it all and say, it's disaster, there's a hole in the ground. I'll never be the same. Do you know what happens when you put manure on the path? Biohazard. It flows on everything else. And sometimes when we have a hard heart, life hits us and we are hitting everyone else. On a rocky soil, it remains rocky. And when it's on my crowded heart, honestly, all the things that are crowding out God, I turn to those instead of him. We need to keep our soft heart. It's worth guarding. It's worth protecting. It's worth everything. I'm going to challenge us with a couple questions. But before I do, uh, you're going to sign off to South Umpqua and Pastor Will and Green with Pastor Paul. They switch places. That's really hard, just in case you're wondering. (laughs) All right. One of the areas I believe we can see how our heart is is how we deal with these next step questions every week. Because when I'm not in a good place, when I'm not really listening, honestly, I want to go. Especially if it's like a rock that he mentioned that's in my life. Um, I just want to get out of here. So please just take the time to just really examine your life. And and where is your heart today? Where is your heart? Where is your heart? Not your neighbors, not your friends, yours. 
Maybe I'm the only one that does that. Um, and then I have a next question, and I'm going to ask for something after the question that's a little different than we normally do, so you're going to have to bear with me. Uh, but what rock or thorn do you need to remove? What rock or thorn do you need to remove? Um, I'm going to pray for us today, but before I do, um, one of the hard parts about preaching, Paul did not warn me, is that, man, you get convicted so hard, and so I have tons of rocks and thorns. I mean, I'm just looking at my life going, God, help me. So I would like, um, you know, if you have a rock or thorn, if I've been preaching and you've been thinking about a rock or thorn, just raise your hand. That's all I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to pray for you. All right, let's pray. God, thank you. Thank goodness. You love me, and you love us, whether there's a rock or thorn or we are in a good soil. God, help us to have courageous patience with ourselves and with each other as we remove rocks Help us to fight for relationship. Fight for relationship with you and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God, help us because we're sunk without you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can... Uh, Give us some feedback. We'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.